All right, good morning again. If you brought a Bible with you this morning, or if you didn't and you would like to have one in your hands, you can grab one of those uh, blue Bibles in the pew rack. So if you have a Bible, uh, I ask you, invite you to open it with me to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 1. It wasn't too long ago that we finished our 18-month series study journey through the Gospel of Mark. And the uh, feedback about that was positive enough that I thought, let's do it again. <laughs> let's, let's do it again, and let's just sort of rewind and, and get a bunch more out of it the second time. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I see a couple of you kind of nodding your heads. One dude, one dude just walked out. Uh, somebody go get him, bring him back. I'm kidding. Uh, but we are going to start in uh, the first chapter of Mark's gospel this morning. Before we do that, let's pray one more time. God, help us to be attentive to you, to set aside our worries, our stress, our distractions, our stuff. Help us to be attentive uh, so that you might do within us and for us and among us and through us the things that you want and desire and long for. Grow us, nurture us, uh, make us into the people uh, you've called us to be by your grace and in your spirit. I pray and ask that as my words are true to your word, that they be taken to heart. If my words stray, deviate, or or inconsistent with your word, may they be quickly forgotten. We pray in Christ the Lord. Amen. So you may remember from our study of the Gospel of Mark that uh, verse 1 of chapter 1 is his thesis statement, kind of title, thesis statement, and everything all wrapped into one. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, Messiah, Son of God. And then unlike Matthew and Luke, who both provide genealogies and birth narratives for Jesus at the beginning of their Gospels, Mark kind of jumps over that and begins by quoting the prophet Isaiah about a messenger who would proceed and pave the way for Messiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Isaiah wrote hundreds of years before. And that messenger, that one calling in the wilderness, of course, was John the Baptist. And then Mark spends about five verses talking about John the Baptist, including finally quoting John, Uh, where John says these words, after me will come one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And now to verse nine of chapter one, listen closely. This is God's word up on the screen. There we go. And I think I'm a little, I'm a little loud up here. Uh, Just FYI on the the feedback I'm getting. Verse 9. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven uh, spoke, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. And that was this. The time has come, Jesus said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. And it's just that last part that I want to focus on this morning, Jesus proclaiming the good news of God. Let's say those words together. Read chapter 15 or verse 15. The time has come, Jesus said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The kingdom or the reign of God has come near in Jesus, through Jesus, by Jesus, the king. And because the king has arrived, the kingdom is at hand, the kingdom is accessible, the kingdom is available to anyone and to everyone who has knowledge, who has awareness of, who has proximity to, who is in the orbit of Jesus. Therefore, Jesus says, repent. And that word repent, it's a little word, 
that will be our focus this morning. For some of us, the word repent may have or carry negative connotations. What comes to mind may be street preachers with big signs telling people, warning people, yelling at people, repent or perish, repent or burn. But Jesus' call here to repent, the Greek word is metataneo, doesn't convey hate, it doesn't convey anger, it doesn't convey heat, it doesn't convey judgment or threats of punishment at all. And yet it really is a key passage and a key word in this passage that we must understand to follow. Metanoia, or metanoia, the noun is a compound word combining the words meta, which means with, after, or behind, and the Greek word noeo, which means to perceive with the mind, to think upon, or to understand. Putting those together as a compound meta noeo, they mean first and most generally to think differently. Again, or afterwards, to think differently again or afterwards, to reconsider and then to change one's mind for the better. And second and more specific to some context in scripture, that word metanoeo, verb, means to change any or all of the elements composing one's life, all of who one is, attitudes, thoughts, and or behaviors, as they pertain to the revelation of God for right living, or more simply, and in English, to repent, to turn, to return, to come back. And so metanoieo is both to think differently or to change one's mind in general, and more specifically, to change one's mind about sin or to repent. Generally, to think differently or to change one's mind about certain things and all things and differently to change one's mind or one's thinking, one's affections and one's commitments, specifically about sin, disobedience, evil, and morality. And this is where Jesus begins his whole public ministry. And so one of the questions when someone is uh, being baptized, as Ray just was, was, do you turn from everything that keeps you from God, do you turn? Do you turn away from those things? Do you do a 180 and do you turn to God, relying on his grace in Jesus? This is essential to life in Christ and so a critical part of baptism. Do you intend to change your thinking? your mind, your will, your intentions and actions with regard to sin and everything that keeps you from God, everything that keeps you from his kingdom, everything that keeps you from his reign in your life. Is this your intention? Is this your desire? Have you, are you, will you repent? And this may still seem like a small thing, a little word, but it's not small at all. It's huge in the big scheme of life in Christ. Remember that Jesus seems to hold together, he holds together the arrival of the kingdom of God, the arrival of the reign of God, and repenting, and repenting. The fact of kingdom, God's kingdom or God's reign and the arrival, presence, and availability of that kingdom are are matters of fact. They were, they are fact. However, access to that kingdom seems to happen primarily through repentance. When one repents, as one changes one's mind, as one changes one's thinking, both about sin in particular and about the nature of reality, the nature of God, and who we are ourselves. Jesus calls us to think differently about sin, and particularly one's own sin, the sin in one's life, and also about the nature of of reality, the nature of God, who we are. Sin, we may think of it in different ways, terms, images, feelings, thoughts. Sin is self. Sin is 
being primarily interested in oneself. Sin is self-promotion, self-adulation, self-indulgence, selfish ambition, self-righteousness, pride. Sin is me first. Sin is greed. Sin is envy. Sin is living in such a way that the world revolves around me, around you. Turn from these things, for among other things, Jesus says, sin kills the soul. Sin is its own punishment, devouring a person, devouring oneself from the inside out. Sin kills me, my sin. And sin spoils relationships, leaving our relationships shallow, rocky, unstable, suspect, tenuous, on thin ice, vulnerable. My sin ruins my soul. My sin ruins my relationships. And my sin harms others. My sin causes me to judge others, loathe others, condemn others, ignore others, and allow others to wither apart from the love of God because it's all about me. And so out of love for us and others, Jesus calls us to repent. He says, turn from sin, leave sin, run from sin. People don't drift away from sin. We drift towards sin. And so Jesus says, turn, go the other way very intentionally. It would have been easy to leave out this rough part of John's message, but Jesus absolutely includes it as essential. And we can do this with the Spirit's help, the Scriptures teach. We can do this through God's grace. When we don't have the ability or the strength or the will on our own, we can. And God's grace can do this not because we have to, in God's grace, we get to. In God's grace, we don't have to, but in God's grace, we get to. Because we are forgiven. Because we are already forgiven. I love Brennan Manning, and he used to say, repentance is not what we do in order to be forgiven. It is what we do because we've already been forgiven. In God's grace, that door is opened. And the order of things, we have to understand rightly. We, don't, we are not forgiven because we repent, but we repent because we are already in Christ forgiven. At the heart of the gospel, of the, or the good news of God, is that Jesus on the cross took upon himself the punishment for our sins so that we could be freed from or released from the condemnation that sin rightly deserves. We are forgiven. We have been released from that condemnation, forgiven. The penalty for our sins, he paid, forgiven. And yet we still bear the consequences or the results or the effects of our sin. Those remain with us as we know all too well. Perpetually, and as long as we remain in sin, as long as we continue to sin, until we turn our lives around in general and in a particular area. Turning one's life around, or as he writes, even more simply, Frederick Dale, Dale, Frederick Dale Bruner writes, change. We remain subject to the effects of sin, the consequences of sin, the results of sin, even though we're forgiven, until we repent, until we turn our lives around. Bruner writes these words, he says, there's nothing tricky about its meaning, repentance, metanoieo. It does not tell what to turn from specifically. Jesus doesn't hear. The emphasis is on turning from our preoccupations, whether sins or goods. And by that, he means good things. The emphasis is on turning, whether from our sins or from good things, toward God. Whatever keeps one from turning toward the coming kingdom is that which one from which one should turn. The very objectlessness of the verb stresses the simplicity and so urgency of the turning. So the object of one's turning, that which one is called to rethink or reconsider, to change one's mind about, and turn from maybe lying or cheating or stealing, classic sins, or it may be 
less so like smugness, or it may not be sin at all. The subject of one's turning, that which we're called to rethink, reconsider, think again about, may be classic sin in our books, or maybe not. It may be turning from an attitude or a belief about one's in-laws or about a competitor in business or a competitor in sports or about the way we think about a neighbor or the way we think about a stranger. Jesus says, think again, reconsider, think differently. That from which Jesus called his followers to turn in the very next verses, right after verse 15, verse 16 begins like this. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further, Jesus saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed Jesus. One could say in a very general sense that Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, and John metanoeoed or decided to think differently about their nets in response to Jesus' call, to think differently about what their lives were about, to reconsider, and then to go a completely different way. In this case, about their vocations, what their lives had been about, what their lives would be about. Fishing was not sin, but it was the thing from which they were called to turn so that they might enter into the kingdom of God. Are you with me? So repentance isn't always from sin, but it is always turning away from the things that God is not calling us to and turning to God in his grace and Jesus, the things to which God is calling us. Similarly, God may be calling you today and me today to do a 180 in our lives with regard to something in our lives that may seem rather harmless or even fruitful and enjoyable in order to enter the kingdom in our midst, the kingdom that has arrived, the kingdom that is accessible to us, that we have in many cases become content to live apart from. God may be calling you to metanoieo, how you spend your discretionary time each day, or how you spend your vacation time, or how you spend your life. Metanoieo calls us always out of complacency and thoughtlessness to rethink, to reconsider, to think differently about things that matter. God may be calling you to think again to reconsider, to think differently about who you love, about who in your mind is lovable and who is not, about who God loves, to think again about those things and to reconsider why you don't love those people whom God loves and to turn from that and exactly that and turn to God in your life. There's something to be said about growing in one's faith to maturing, to growing in knowledge and faith and confidence and certainty in one's faith and about what one believes. The danger in that sometimes, however, is beginning to think that one has all of the answers, always, and that one has arrived in the way one thinks about certain things, thinks about certain topics, thinks about certain passages of Scripture, thinks about certain people. God is constantly calling us to think again, to reconsider, and often to think differently in a different way. God may be calling you to think differently about how you pray or don't pray or to change our thinking about prayer, to change the way we think about prayer and then do something different in the way we pray. 
Last week we talked about change, which is close to repentance. Change for the church. And there was a lot that was hard about that, especially for some of us. Repentance, metanoia, oh, change can be really hard. This week we're talking about change on an individual level. The former may be difficult, the latter sometimes feels impossible. If you're like me, there are areas of your life and areas of my thinking that have probably needed to change for decades, but haven't. But as we open ourselves to God and his spirit and say, what needs to change? How do I need to repent? Where and in what ways do I need to think differently about something or someone or someones? Sometimes the waters get stirred and things begin to move. Last week we talked about change for the church. Uh, This morning it's more about change for ourselves individually. Hence, Leo Tolstoy once said, everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing himself. How true is that? Lots of us have at different stages and ages in our life thought, I want to be a part of changing the world. And in some ways that is and seems easier in our experience than changing ourselves or allowing God to change me. What gives me hope in all of this, though, is that in the scriptures, repent, the verb, the call, is not only that, but also described as a gift. If you look through the scriptures, and especially the New Testament, repent isn't the person with the sign or the banner who's screaming really loud with a harsh voice and a difficult message but so often it's an invitation of love, an invitation of God's Spirit who is offering us an opportunity and the help to change and be conformed to the thinking of God in ways that are almost impossible on our own. Repentance is not really as much a demand as it is an offer and a gift. And God helps us through this with his spirit, and he helps us with his grace. He gives us the power to ask for the power to repent, and sometimes that's what it takes. I've got a friend, and he posted on social media yesterday, 17 years of sobriety after living on the streets, after being uh, addicted to drugs for years, for having his life in the tank for literally years, 17 years without a smoke, 17 years without a drink. That's a remarkable glory to God accomplishment or reality. But it's not just those awful sins that our culture, our society, and that we look down upon from which God calls us to repent, rethink, reconsider, think differently. We get into ruts of behavior, attitudes, dispositions, and hearts that become so ingrained in us that it seems that change in itself is nearly impossible. But if we begin by God's grace and with the Spirit's help to prayerfully reconsider and to seek to think differently and to say, as Paul wrote at the beginning of Romans 12, help us, God, to renew our minds to have our minds renewed, that once our minds are renewed, once we willingly open ourselves to thinking differently about things, once we let go of thinking about me and how that works for me and how I want things to be, things can get loosened up and change can begin. We often find that God opens doors that have previously and forever seemed shut and locked in our lives. He does this by his invitation to repent, by his call to repent, and if you will, his insistence 
that we repent. And so if you're like me, we need to live in this continual spin cycle of sorts. Repentance is not something we do once and at the beginning, but it is a continual activity over and over. God, help me to think differently, think more clearly, think according to your will, reconsider that I might be continually more and more conformed into your image and likeness. My sense, and I could be wrong, this is, as Paul would say, this is Shannon speaking and not the Lord. I think most of us, and I think it's true for me, tend to believe what we want to believe. I cling to what is comfortable, what I can handle, what I can understand. I believe what I want to believe and what works out for me. All too often I see people interpreting scripture and the message of the gospel in ways that just coincidentally happen to fit perfectly with their life, their worldview, their politics, etc. I don't know if that's ever happened. Uh, Anne Lamott said something about, isn't it curious or interesting that God loves exactly the same people that I love? And God hates exactly the same people I hate. Maybe that's not exactly true. And so in what area, in what way is God calling you to metanoieo in order that you might participate, be in or go into his kingdom? And notice this, the kingdom comes fact. It's not dependent on our repentance but rather the kingdom is, the kingdom awaits, and our repentance or our turning allows us to enter into the kingdom that already is. In what ways is God calling me and you today to repent, to rethink, reconsider, and really think differently about some things, about things in the church, about the way we are church, about the way we do church, about the way that you follow Jesus, about the way that you live, about the way that you think, about who you love, about your smugness about certain things, or mine more, about your refusal to forgive someone. You've got your reasons. I've got mine. About grudges, about cynicism, Or what good things in your life is God calling you to think differently about? This is the message Jesus has at the beginning. Repent, not in order to bring about the kingdom, but repent because the kingdom is already here. And I think God's up in heaven and right here just saying it's there. It's there for you, church. It's there for you, people. It awaits my reign and my rule in your life to bring about my kingdom and my glory and goodness again like it was in the beginning in creation. Goodness everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. God has been longing and working to reconstitute that global and in everything goodness for thousands of years for forever, and he's calling us to be a part of that church. May we always be people who don't think, oh, I repented once, or I'll repent of that thing someday if I need to. Repentance is an invitation to start over, an invitation to participate in God's grace, an invitation to rely on him, an invitation to think differently about something we may be stuck on and that's causing damage, harm, etc., in our life, in our relationships, in our community. Brothers and sisters, church, Jesus says, repent metanoeo, because the kingdom of God is here. Let's pray. Ah, before we pray, I'm going to do something just for fun. 
uh, if you will, grab a, one of those white cards on the, in the pew rack in front of you, and there's a pen if you don't have a pen, or if you uh, rather write with some other instrument or way, do that. But as we pray and leave some space for contemplation, how is God calling you to repent today? Of what or from what is God calling you to turn or turn away from today? Maybe it's a good thing. Maybe it's a deep, dark sin that nobody knows about and you will never tell anyone about. But what is God calling you to turn from in order that you might turn to his available and accessible kingdom? I'd encourage you to write something down, one thing, lots of things. It's a, maybe it's an attitude. Maybe it's a disposition. Maybe it's, again, smugness. Write that thing down. And if you're up for it, during our closing song, you can come throw it in the basket up here on this table up front as an offering to God, as a response, as a way of responding to God's word. If you don't want to, that's fine. If you don't want to write anything down, that's fine. If you want to write something down but don't want to let go of it and don't want to bring your paper, take a picture of it and then drop the paper. No one's going to, don't put your name on it. Let's pray. God, call us, uh, help us to remember that repentance is for all of us, always and continually and over and over again. Help us to rethink our attitudes about sins that we've come to enjoy or prosper in or cling to. Help us to rethink the things that we've chosen to love, that have our affections, things that, seem, things that may seem good or helpful or neutral, not harmful, not hurtful to others or to ourselves. But help us to submit all of those things to you. And if you would have us think differently about relationships or the church or our jobs or our vocations or our pastimes or our free time or our resources, Help us to think differently according to your will and your way. And we give all of this to you, relinquishing our own will, submitting ourselves to you who are totally good and in every way. We trust you. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your patient love with us to us and for us, in your beloved Son, in whose name we pray. Amen.